Versailles during the reign of Louis XIV, XV and XVI, economies were always being made to accommodate the many mistresses, the salaries of the servants and the tutors. This meant that the royal silver and gold plate was constantly being melted down for coinage. A minister named Silhouette launched an austerity program. Trousers without pockets, dresses without flounces, and it affected everyone. Silhouette became and has remained the word for a mere outline of vacant black ever since. Antoinette wanted to take the lead wherever she felt she had something useful to give. The first opportunity to present itself was opera. Arriving from Vienna, the most advanced musical city in Europe at the time, she was completely appalled by the stiff works and bad productions held at the French court. She brought composer Christophe Willibald Gluck, who had taught her the spinet, to Paris. She championed him as he improved standards of production and changed the course of French opera. Held in the opera house within Versailles, a space that caused many to cry out in wonder when they first entered. Pascal Joseph Tascan of Paris made a harpsichord fitted with miniature keys for a child of very wealthy parents, possibly even for Marie Antoinette's eight-year-old daughter, Maria Theresa. It is in a japanned case, the decoration in a style of Far Eastern lacquer with figures in Oriental poses playing Oriental instruments. Antoinette also encouraged the ballet, particularly Mademoiselle Hinel, who was the first dancer to execute the pirouette. This new movement meant dispensing with the heavy trappings of the ballet, inherited from the Sun King's reign, and lighter, more graceful costumes were designed. This did not involve increased expenditure, and in fact, her economies reduced budgets throughout the arts as well as in fashion, where she rejected the fussy brocades and satins, which were made into complicated patterns adorned with fringes, laces and ribbons, in favour of simpler, plainer fabrics and styles. It was Antoinette who made fashionable a new shade of purplish brown, which we now call puce, to which a courtier gave the affected name of honest compromise. Louis laughingly said it was the colour of a flea and various subshades called flea's belly, flea's back and flea's thigh became the rage. Fleas were a major problem and ladies often wore fur around their necks to attract them so they would leap off their bodies, be found and destroyed. By wearing clothes in a simpler style and a single colour with very little jewellery, Marie Antoinette also saved money. One of the most important things in her life was friendship, a word that constantly reoccurs in all her written correspondence. The older courtiers rejected her, as she called them, the centuries. She likened them to sealed envelopes she could not open, and she brought a sense of fun and frivolity to the court which they openly disliked. In the splendour of her state bedroom each morning, she carried on the formal ceremony of the levee to greet the people petitioning her favour. Once the ceremonies were complete, she would escape to her petite apartments, completed in 1781. They were entered through a jib door covered in brocade to match the walls and help conceal it. Off-white and gilded wasserie or panels were embellished with delicate neoclassical motives. The mirrors reflected the blue upholstery on her divan bed, originally meant to be temporary while the richer silks were being woven at Lyon. The detailing throughout her petite apartments testifies to the splendour of French furnishings during the reign of the Ancien Régime. La Liaison's Dangerous was among Antoinette's favourite novels, all of which were housed 
in her tiny green library hung with silk. Libraries were not as important as they had been under the Marquis de Pompadour's influence and literature standards fell to a very low ebb later in the century in France. Doors from the library accessed two salons, one for musical entertainment with her harp, which became the favoured instrument for all refined ladies. Marie Antoinette enjoyed the warm texture of carved woodwork and wherever possible replaced marble or stucco facings with panelling. She preferred graceful tables, desks and small cupboards lined with marquetry flowers such as those produced by cabinet maker Jean-Henri Riesner and Georges Jacob and she bought heavily from them both. When she wished a new piece of furniture made she had sketches submitted on which she gave her views and a model was then rendered with variations for her to choose from. The most famous piece of furniture ever made for her was a jewellery cabinet, designed and completed by Ferdinand Schwarzenegger in 1787. It had inset panels by history painter Jean-Jacques Langrenet and superb figure mounts modelled by sculptor Louis Simon Boiseau. Antoinette did not like hunting and found removing to the Chateau of Fontainebleau every autumn intolerable. This tradition had dated from the 11th century and the Royal Hunting Lodge has had many alterations and additions since that time. Set in a forest full of game, the Chateau was completely isolated. Antoinette's boudoir was decorated in polychrome colours with intertwining flowers and ribbons reminiscent of contemporary silks manufactured in Lyon. The vertical motives and stripes are characteristic features of the Louis XVI or neoclassical style. They were intertwined with the letters M and A and painted by the Russo brothers. The original furniture was by master craftsman Georges Jacob, 1739-1814, and Jean-Henri Riesner, 1734-1806. The reflections made by the glimmering light of the candelabra were enough to give an atmosphere of secret festivity to this petite room. She commissioned the steel, bronze and mother of pearl furniture from Riesner, which still survives as a reminder of her imagination and caprice. It is quite unique. The Indian mogul technique of studying furniture with mother of pearl in a fish scale pattern was accomplished in a most stylish fashion. Riesner had a great career. Louis XVI employed him from 1774 onward and he created furniture for Antoinette's boudoir when he was 50 years old and his art at its zenith. He is renowned for his refinement of taste and great skill in craftsmanship. She had a mechanical table made for taking meals in bed. Its height was adjustable at the touch of a button. It also became a toilet table and a third button turned it into a writing table. This table is now in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. At Paris, Madame du Barry, Louis XV's last and most infamous mistress, was busily championing the preference for classical architecture and interiors in the design, arrangement and decoration of her small pavilion built for her by Louis XV. The pavilion was in the severe elegant style inspired by Ange Gabriel's work at Versailles. It was designed especially for her by Claude Nicolas Ledoux in the gardens of the Chateau de La Vercienne. Built in 1771, its unified and harmonious character made it a landmark and a premier example of the neoclassical style. The advanced taste of its decoration and furnishings impressed all who saw it. Claude Nicolas Ledoux, 1736 to 1806, 
became a fashionable architect patronised by Madame de Barry. He is considered one of the most daring and extreme exponents of neoclassicism in France and the boldest innovator of the century. He studied under that great teacher of architects, J.F. Blondel, at Paris. He did not go to Italy, although he was profoundly influenced by the designs of Italian architecture, as engraved by an Italian artist renowned for his etchings of Rome, Giovanni Battista Piranesi, 1720-1728. Lado was renowned for being eccentric and quarrelsome. He was immensely successful and never lacked commissions. His works designed after being appointed a Camadician and architect du Roy in 1773 are his most advanced and original. They range from extreme minimalism to a supreme expression of his feeling for the elemental and primeval. His book of designs was not published in folio form until after the revolution, although it had been conceived long before. No other architect had attempted such startling innovations as he. His art in architecture was highly sophisticated. Exacting patronage was available to architects of brilliance. Much money and talent was lavished on houses and villas in and around Paris, few of which have survived today. The Bagatelle, a villa in the Bois de Bologna at Paris, was built in 1777 and is one of the notable exceptions. Inside the pavilion, its services were placed at convenient points so that the whole house could run as smoothly as possible. It was the French genius for the design of this type of layout and arrangement based on practicality and needs that was most admired and copied throughout Europe and England. In the Maison Montmorency, built at Paris around 1772, Claude Ledeau dealt with a very difficult site. He also installed a Lou La Anglaise, an interior Lou, which for many was still a revolutionary arrangement. Madame du Barry patronised the Marchand Mercier, Simon Philippe Poirier and Dominique Decker, whose very popular and well-known retail establishment offered ladies or gentlemen of quality with superb furniture and objets d'art. They supplied her with Sèvres, Chantilly and Meissen porcelain that was set off by exquisite gilt bronze mounts, such as this garniture of vases, made around 1770 to 80, which has ormolu mounts attributed to Jean-Claude Duplessis. Her rejection of four paintings commissioned from Fragonard in the Rococo taste has always sparked discussion and debate. Now in the Frick collection in New York, some sources say it was because the figures were far too like the king and his mistress, which constituted a breach of royal etiquette. Others say it could be perhaps attributed to her desire to fully embrace a new style, not of that of her former rival, Madame de Pompadour. Although many reasons are put forward, they are all speculation, because she was to lose her pretty head without leaving us any written proof. Much consideration was given over to the decoration of boudoirs, the personal room of a woman. It carried with it an implication that this was a setting for dalliance and erotic pursuit. Antoinette loved the seven-roomed Petit Trianon, designed by Ange Gabriel for Madame de Pompadour. You love flowers, Madame, and so I have a bouquet to give you. And with these words, Louis XVI reputedly gifted his wife this splendid little place. She began spending her afternoons there, returning to Versailles in the evening. Following an outbreak of measles, she stayed the night and she liked it so much that she decided to spend more time there. Artist Richard Meek was asked to undertake alterations. 
It was in here that she gathered with her friends for informal giving, far from the court fussiness where etiquette was relaxed. The interior decoration of her boudoir in the Petit Trianon was very clever, as it became a room of moving mirrors at night, the windows hidden by sliding panels incorporating looking glasses into gilt frames. The king did not come unless he was officially invited, and he is known to have never slept there. The pleasure house, once a realm of gallantry and flirtation, became the setting for a comfortable bourgeois way of life. The queen lived there much as we might live in a country house of seven or eight rooms today, refusing to follow the dictates of her rank. The Trianon Garden was her idea and a work of art. It contained a temple of love modelled on the Temple of Vesta at Rome. The lawns were very English, smooth and close, as described to her by her English friends. The garden was distinctive, filled with hyacinths, roses, tulips and irises, grouping them by kind and colour, red, white, yellow and her favourite colour, blue. Orange trees were also a favourite, and they had been a favourite of French kings since the time of Louis XIV. They were yet another feature of her garden in which she planted enough to yield in a good year a hundred pounds of blossom, esteemed for making orange flower water, which she gave away as gifts. In its grounds lay the Belvedere Pavilion, guarded by six sphinxes. The octagonal interior had walls decorated with sculptures of garden tools and emblems of love by La Riche. It was fitted out with gold and white furniture covered in the Queen's favourite, Blue Gros de Tour. During this period, decoration became cooler, more academic and acquired a distinct architectural attitude. Walls were articulated by pilasters or columns, ceilings were coffered quite often by means of illusionistic painting and decor came to consist more of sculpture than of painting. Parquet floors or marble laid in lozenge patterns were preferred with black and white the most popular. Mirrors covered walls and wallpapers printed by Revillon became fashionable. Ange Gabriel's form of neoclassicism was uniquely French, elegant, retaining formality, very unlike the Palladians in England. The boudoir of Madame Cerie was designed in the 1770s. It was decorated intricately from floor to ceiling with oil paintings, gilded plasterwork and arabesques. Painted decoration became the chief vehicle for embellishing the interior. Simple paintwork had always been required and now a fashion grew up once more for arabesques. Interiors became colourful, walls flat with only shallow chair rails, friezes etc. And the breaking up of wall surfaces with paintwork or wallpaper imitated a wide range of coverings was less expensive than the real thing. It remains an anomaly of French life that when Louis XVI's courtiers were fawning admiration over the splendour that was the chateau at Versailles, Marie Antoinette ordered country life with the royal seal of approval by having the architect Richard Meek, who was the last to work at Versailles, to design and build for her a small country village, complete with its own dairy. In her pseudo-rustic hamlet, Marie Antoinette and her ladies endeavoured to lead some sort of meaningful daily existence. The hamlet had its own animals, grew its own grapes for wine and vegetables and fruit to eat. Every morning at 5am, just like other women who worked on a farm, she would haul her milking stool out of the barn, rub her chafed hands with goose fat against the cold and milk the cows. Antoinette was a simple happy soul. In the strictures of rigid court life, she, as others in her circumstances, had become isolated from the realities of everyone else's lives. 
Aristocrats and revolutionaries alike criticised her at every turn. The vicious attacks on Marie Antoinette in the scurrilous pamphlets of the day attributed her to all sorts of unspeakable crimes, as well as those terrible words that she did not ever utter. Words which would have been completely inconceivable in the more humanitarian late 18th century, and certainly by a lady of her innate sensibilities. Madame du Barry followed the Queen to the guillotine, sacrificing the secret of where she had buried her jewels on a promise to save herself by revealing their whereabouts. She was ultimately betrayed and dragged screaming to a dreadful death. Marie Antoinette and her son and daughter endured dreadful suffering at the hands of the revolutionaries following Louis XVI's death. The details are truly appalling. They were also far removed from the democratic principles and rights as individuals that the rest of the French people were demanding for themselves. The Machiavellian principle of the end justifying the means prevailed rather than the Christian principle of doing to others what you would have them do to you. Although they chopped off her pretty head, the French people did not forget that she had honoured country life. And so the combination of fashionable pride and rural conservatism led to the royal style of interior design being preserved for over 200 years.